This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Parental discretion is advised. This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway. Supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza, sliceonbroadway.com. IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show. Just wait, just wait, just wait, just wait, just wait. Just wait. Hey guys, it is the Wrestling Mayhem Show, and this is a special edition, of course. Uh, we like to do, we've done this before, and we're trying to get these lined up here uh, for the holidays as we like, like to take a little bit of break as we head into the new year and the holidays and 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 recover from whatever the uh, sexy, talented dudes have done to me on the Indie Mayhem Show this year. Uh, so, you know, we, we had a few ideas coming up, and of course, uh, we had a great conversation earlier in this year uh, with one of our guests that inspired this episode. Uh, so this is going to be all about Impact Wrestling, TNA, Global Force, whatever you want to call them, whatever area, well, NWA TNA they were at one point. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I have a panel of experts. This is going to be an Impact Wrestling therapy session. First of all, if you're a uh, long-time uh, Wrestling Mayhem Show followers know that the most impacted by impact on the show has been Mad Mike from Poughkeepsie, New York, who has been valiantly and bravely doing the midweek war, watching Impact Wrestling so you didn't have to for the last several years when many of us have gone away from it, and he is mm-hmm. joining us right now. Yeah, um, not only did I do the midwa- mid- midweek war to watch Impact, uh, before that, I was the only one we talked about on the main show. Before that, I actually wrote reviews of Impact. Oh, geez. Yes, if you, you remember yes, that. You I, I remember I remember doing live, like, stream of consciousness reviews of Impact. And uh, before that, I was just watching it because I hated myself, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, you've had some trouble, troubled years, and, 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 and that really kind of lends into it. Trouble, no, trouble, 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 trouble. <laughs> And of course, like I mentioned, you know, we had a, uh, some great conversations earlier this year with this fellow Pittsburgh wrestling legend. Uh, he is Shirley Doe joining us on the line. Thank you for joining us, sir. Hello. And I used to go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I used to also write an impact report. We used to do a wrestling comedy site called Counting the Lights, and somehow I drew the shortest straw. And uh, I watched. <laughs> I probably watched twelve years of Impact. Oh, I've watched geez. it from the beginning, though, which is what I'm really excited to talk. I'm like literally bursting with excitement to talk about, about the first three shows, which could take uh, the rest of my life to talk about. Yeah, because because I didn't watch a lot of the uh, the paper the pay per view ones. Like I, I, didn't, had a, I didn't watch I had the pay per view ones. I, I watched it once I got to Fox Sports, okay. and I pretty much watched it since then. I had a uh, <laughs> a legal uh, hacked satellite card for Directv. <laughs> So I religiously, well, I got one just to watch the TNA pay-per-views, which should show you where my priorities as a Mark lie. <laughs> oh, and um, also, I, I don't know if we'll get to it, but I was rummaging, and I found an old TNA program from 2010. Oh, geez. Oh. Um, hold on, I'm just going to flip to a random page before we start, just so I can get... Oh, um, well, Black Machismo, Jay Lethal, and King of the Mountain, Jeff Jarrett. Oh man, yeah, lovely. I so the piece of TNA I talked to these guys before. I have the greatest piece of TNA merch. Um, my friend uh, Farnsworth from uh, IWC, one of the announcers. Uh, he uh, he for my birthday one year he got me a signed picture of Hermie Sandler, the NASCAR driver that was in TNA, <laughs> and it has a piece of the guitar that he hit Jeff Jarrett with. And it has a, a Polaroid of that happening, but it's all in like the presentation of it is in this beautiful box. And it used to hang in my, uh, in our room. We used to do our podcast, the, the Kind of Lights podcast, and, and which is now my bedroom. And when my wife first moved in, she was like, what, what the fuck is this thing? And I was like, I, it would take a year to explain to you, and it would be so embarrassing. <laughs> well, and, and that kind of goes with it. You know, TNA was not. 
uh, maybe some of us record, refer to as a, maybe a dump spot, dumpster fire of a show these days, right? But there were bright spots. There's a reason, like, you know, I remember early on in our podcast, you know, we were like, oh, TNA is going to be the great alternative, right? And we got to see guys like AJ Styles and Samoa Joe have amazing matches over there. Like, what to you guys were the high points of TNA Impact Wrestling? I like that you started this like I start performance reviews. Like, because I'm generally going to be like, okay, everything you do is shit. But first, let me give you some jelly to go with the peanut butter. I think probably Samoa Joe's match with uh, the Samoa Joe feud with Kurt Angle is probably the high point of TNA because, like, their series of matches, especially the real MMA influence match, was awesome. That was really good. And I re- and again, there was a lot of X Division guys. There was, um, there's been some strange characters that came in. You know, there's a lot of AAA and uh, New Japan guys that got their first. American exposure there, maybe not the best exposure, but we'll get to that, I'm sure. Talking about Okada at some point. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. You they, forgot Okada was in TNA. Okada was in TNA. Oh, jeez. Oh, he, he also <laughs> got uh, mock raped in TNA, and they had to apologize to New Japan the last time they were there. Like, they formally apologized to him. But, uh, yeah. Oh, um, but that's probably... I would point to those as the best parts. I think the the one good part of it is that I I did not grow up a WWE fan. I grew up, especially other territories. I think I talked about last time I was on the show. So the fact that there was this monopoly, it was nice. That it's been nice to have another company, but also it's been really painful to have another company at times too. <laughs> um, if I had to pick my favorite, like there there were some things I really liked about DNA. For a while, they did tag team wrestling really well. Yeah. Um, the AJ, AJ Daniels Joe feud obviously is up there. But I think my favorite TNA feud, and it's a little bit more recent, but it I think it has to be EC3 and Rockstar Spud. Because mm. they had an amazing just storyline. They they had like because it was with it was with the whole Dixieland stuff, like Spud came up as EC3's lackey. It was like it was almost like their version of DiBiase and Virgil. Very oh similar, God. only like only like their DB, their Virgil actually went up the ranks. Like, um, I mean, what they did with kind of both characters after the feud ended with the head shaving really kind of just spiraled downwards as TNA is wont to do. But uh, the feud that they had that ended with Rockstar Spud getting his head shaved was just fantastic. Mm. I, really, really I, I well checked out by that point. I mean, honestly, pretty- honestly, that's that's worth a watch. Okay. That's watch the team, the the Rockstar Spud EC three feud. That is worth a watch. Like apart from the Broken Hardy stuff, yeah, that's the, the, really the only thing in the past like three years of TNA has been relevant for me. That's probably right after the Broken Hardy stuff. Once the Hardys were done, that's kind of when I stopped watching. So that kind of got me re reinterested in it. Uh, and take it from me, I went through a lot of TNA stuff. I watched the whole uh, British reality show where they picked Rockstar Spud. Oh, British Boot Camp. And I had, yeah, I downloaded <laughs> everything. And I would watch British Boot Camp during the commercials because it was really, if you're going to get punched in the face, get punched in the face for real. Uh, just, <laughs> and just do it the whole time. But it's like it's amazing that like Marty Skrull was one of the guys. And they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll pick Rockstar Spud. It was, Spud's <laughs> great, but... <laughs> there was a lot of talent on that show. I also like that they invented situations for the talent, like a very reality show. But I honestly, this is really hard because I have so many of my favorite bad TNA moments. That the so I guess maybe we should. I'm gonna hold them, but I'm bursting with excitement. Well, well, Who else was in British Boot Camp? Was was it like anyone that WWE has in the uh, like in the UK tournament now? I'm look, I'm trying to look it up online. Um, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking. If only I had a magic box that had every answer in front of me. Uh, TNA British Boot Camp. It was a, a program with two NME at the end of it. You guys know uh, Marty Scroll, Hannah Blossom, Holly Blossom, Rockstar Spud, uh, and then Doug Williams and Al Snow were the mentors, and Mark Rocco, who was uh, t- the original Black Tiger in New Japan. I think that's the whole reason I watched because I wanted to see uh, Roller, Rollerball Rocco beat somebody up. You know who else was in there? Hmm. Nikki Cross. Oh yeah, oh, Nikki, Nikki Cross, Kaylee Ray, oh, uh, Dave Mastiff. Yep, El Ligero. Oh, Noam Dar. Who's that guy? Oh, no one's oh, ever Grado heard of him. Too. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, Danny Birch was in there. Jeez. <laughs> Boy, they had a lot of boy, guys. In. DNA really fucked up. <laughs> and they had Vi- yeah, Viper too. Wow. So yeah. Well, it's like who wants to go to Nashville and work for a shitty company and everybody put their hands under the table. That's a that's a fair point. <laughs> uh, from the chat room, I, you know, while we're on the uh, positive point of our performance review, um, I, I, I did ask, you know, what were the kind of their favorite moments from from uh, TNA history. Uh, Alex Miller out there out west is uh, saying his favorite feud is Generation Me and Motor City Machine Guns, which uh, Generation Me was the Young Bucks, the young right? Bucks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also he loves uh, Motor City Machine Guns uh, versus Beer Money. Uh, so you're a real big Motor yeah. City Machine Guns fan. Well, who is it? Uh, Tina loved, uh, you know, seconding the Joe and Angle feud. Um <laughs> So, so I mean, there were bright spots. There were definitely yeah, I mean, bright spots had, in there. They had some great tag teams. For me, like, I, I, I should I should say my introduction to TNA wrestling was I got an awareness when Insane Clown Posse was guesting on the pay per views, <laughs> and my friend from uh, from the Art Institute was like, "Hey, come over. I'm getting the the ten dollar pay per view. We'll split it." And we'll see what the hell ICP is doing on 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 this wrestling company. And then that was introducing us to wow, Ravens here doing stuff. And uh, you know uh, 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 who who's this AJ Styles guy and Ron Killings and everything like that. And kind of that was my first kind of awareness of it. And it kind of kept kept an eye on it. BC steals in the chat and it says favorite moment was the reverse battle royal. That is the greatest <laughs> thing ever. I don't know about the greatest thing ever. You know, you know, like when you let somebody do all the drugs they want to do just to see if they'll die. Like that's kind of what this TNA was. Like, when, like you know, like in WWE, like people were like told Vince Russo, like, yeah, that's a good idea, and they took his really good stuff and used it, and they got rid of most, almost all of his bad stuff. Like Beaver Cleavage made it onto the air, and some of the other crap made it on the air. Yeah. WCW, there was a lot of stuff that made it on the air, but you're like, how? I'm sure there were some ideas that people said no. And TNA was like the end of people saying no. It was like, just say like, what? Yeah, sure. That's great. TNA's, the, my favorite TNA moment is the fact that they told the network that Vince Russo would have nothing to do with the product and then sent, CC'd an email to everybody that he had written so that everybody could tell that he worked for the network an hour after they promised him he was gone. So uh, it's an amazing, he, not even like a bad wrestling company, like a bad, and like I have major issues with uh, Dixie Carter because she talks about being a PR professional and I've spent most of my career, that's what I do for a living. I'm a marketing person for my real life. She is every social media person. I legally can't talk about social people. Like, I have a NDA where I can't say things about certain people in the industry, but she reminds me of a lot of people, not maybe at the place I have an NDA with, but maybe that, uh, that I've dealt with in social media. Yeah, There's Dixie- some bad decisions all around. Dixie never seemed like the most Twitter savvy person because she's actually DM'd me before. Oh, geez. oh really? Yeah. Di- hold on. Let me see if I can find the DM. I don't even remember what it was about because I think it was me making some sort of snarky response. Um, uh, but yeah, no. Was this during the days of the TNA street, digital street team that would send you um, DMs if you, they didn't like the way you wrote reviews? Do you know about that? Uh, no, because I, like, I definitely like, would have received one of those. They had like 200 fans whose whole job was to go into message boards and do uh, different groups and then find blogs that talk about TNA and try to set them straight about how it was a good promotion. My dream was to get a letter from these people because like my TNA reviews, like generally I would do like a chart down the side of how many drinks I had had while I was watching it. And like I'd get to like five or six Bloody Marys by the end of TN of watching TNA. That that would explain <laughs> some of the hate that you've gotten over the years on your on your reviews, Mike. Yeah, well, um, I I do like to point out. Um, I, I I forgot Jeremy Borash also DM'd me at one point. <laughs> this, um, is like my, this is like my dream to interact with. It's like to go behind the curtain of shit. Uh, apparently, I am. Uh, I found found my DMs from Dixie Carter. Apparently, I'm blocked by Dixie Carter. <laughs> I'm I'm blocked by Dixie Carter, Jeremy Borash, and Impact Wrestling as a whole. Oh jeez, and you personally, thankfully, not the Mayhem Show. Um, yeah, no, me personally, like, which is really funny because I don't talk about wrestling a lot on my personal feed. Jeez, 
They they know. They know enough that it, it, you're the one, and they're not going to punish the whole show. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but, hey, Jerry Boris, upstanding guy. I, I, I've had a chat with him before. And I, and I remember, like, they used to have, like, we were able to chat with a lot of the guys early on. I remember we had conversations with Eric Young while he was part of TNA. Um, I can't even remember how many others. But then, like, Billy Gunn said something on a radio show, and that shut that down. And we can never get anybody again. Uh, so, like, it, it, it's kind of that weird relationship because, uh, you know, over the years. Yeah, and uh, I don't – like, Eric Young, we also had um, – oh, who was it? The, um, the the redneck guy. Oh, Cody Diener. Cody Diener. Yeah, yeah Diener. Who, who I ran oh, into. Oh, man. I, I ran into him at um, – when the Global Force did a show here, uh, was that last year, I think. And like I'm, I'm standing like next to him at his table. I'm just like, oh shit, you're Cody Diener because I haven't seen him for years. So I didn't like he's got a different look and everything now, right? And I know he's been doing I would stuff. Hope so. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. This is post marriage to one dirty bitch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, she's changed her name now. It's one dirty Briscoe. Oh, oh, geez. I didn't even know, dude. Oh my god, is she married to Wes Briscoe in the angle? Because if so. Oh, I would be so pleased. Oh no, but that's a crossover that should have happened. <laughs> Babyface Wes Briscoe is one of my least favorite, most favorite PNA guys ever. Because I've never seen he literally controls like a PS1 wrestling character. Like I his, forgot the, entirely about Wes Briscoe. His body does not move from his chest to his knees. Like it's like all straight as a board. And um he's like one of the most awkward wrestlers I've ever seen, which mm -hmm. makes me love him. By the way, I was thumbing through this. I apparently yeah. have Kurt Angle's autograph. Man. Oh. I apparently have Kurt Angle's autograph right there. Oh. I've Hermie Sandler's, so, I mean, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there was a few autographs I saw in here. Like, I have Earl Hebner's, but I'm like, I know there had to be a reason that I kept this. Hmm. And and it turns out I think it's because of that Kurt Angle autograph that's in there. Oh. And like, like I said, so, so like, I think we've we've done enough positive here. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, um, we, we've given a lot of credit. I mean, people are going to. Oh, there he is, the Deaner. Oh yes, yes, he was and great. Look who's right was next it? to him. Hey, up, up, down, down zone. Consequences, Creed. That's another of my favorite TNA moments when he took that DDT and puked all over the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched the gif of that maybe t anytime I'm really depressed. If you come in the room and I'm watching Consequences, Creed throw up, you know that. I'm in a dark place and I need, it's like my uh, happy lamp. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a deep cut of wrestling. Like really the fact that I've ever seen a vagina is, is amazing that I can like, like really talk through TNA like to this level. It's really embarrassing. So and, and, God, and my yes, wife yes, Tina, working and not watching this. Tina. Yes. West, West Briscoe was a part of aces and eights. Technically oh. aces and eights <laughs> is something that like, you know, whenever, you go into like that fugue state when you've been abused and you like don't remember things and like things come back. Like every once in a while, I'll remember something that happened with aces and eights. And I'm like, what? what? No. And, and it just hurts. Well, it's aces like, and eights, aces and eights had one legitimately amazing moment. Yeah. The funeral of Team 3D. Yeah, that was good. The funeral of Team 3D was legitimately hilarious. Well, also the wedding of Hogan's wife, uh, Hogan's wife, the same thing, Hogan's daughter and Bully Ray. Again. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, my God. Oh. Yeah, see, you forgot. I brought that. I, I oh. forgot Brooke Hogan was even in TNA. Oh, she was no all character. over TNA. There were whole shows where Brooke would be in the front row, and I would count how many times the camera would get on her, and I'd be like, they're not going to put her in an angle. And then they went beyond my wildest dreams mm -hmm. of putting her in an angle. Wasn't she leader of the knockouts at one point, too? Yes, yeah, she was in charge of the knockouts division. <laughs> my favorite knockout, I'm just going to say it now in case I don't get to say it on the show. Lacey Von Erich is my all time favorite <laughs> knockout. <laughs> I was just about to mention Lacey Von Erich. I swear, I, there was one segment that uh, it's always been burned into my brain. Yeah. Where the beautiful people were trying to create ratings. So they had Kevin Nash. Uh, like Kevin Nash ordered a a triple threat mud wrestling match, or maybe it was a one on one mud wrestling match with one of them as a referee. Yeah, <laughs> just all of them in a mud pit at the same time. Who was the girl that was Katie Birch? 
Oh, um, what Katie. Was no, it was Katie Lee. Katie Lee, but she had like a vampire gimmick in TNA. Winter? Winter, yeah. Winter, she yeah. actually does like uh, horror movie DVDs now. I just got... Um, oh my God, I need to see those. Yeah, I just <laughs> I need to see this. She puts out, but she does the intros for them. And uh, I was okay. like, she's not actually acting in them? No, no, she just does like a little uh, intro. And they're... I really like horrible movies, so it's most of those. But I love that her character was pretty much a lesbian vampire from like uh, Twins of Evil or Vampires uh, Lesbos. Les- a lesbian ghost vampire. Yeah, that no one remember, else. She she but, also she also did the Ultimate Warrior thing where she could appear in a mirror, but not appear in real life. <laughs> that was my fa- also. So here's the the most critical problem with TNA. It's the the Vince Russo problem where Vince Russo one time said um, that he he said that he couldn't figure out the difference between faces and heels, and he was like. <laughs> And he, uh, who's the guy that used to manage, uh, oh God. see, I can remember a lot of stuff, but names, once you get hit in the head a lot, I can't remember names real well. The guy who uh, looks like Jake Garrett that, uh, used to manage, um, the Eli blue, the blue brothers. And, um, not, he's not, the guy Oh, who, Dutch, Dutch. Dutch Mantel. Yeah. So he asked Dutch Mantel, he's like, how do you figure out this face heel thing? And Dutch Mantel, they were in a hotel room. And I guess Dutch threw a Bible at him. And he's like, well, you just look at this thing, and it usually explains how good guys and bad guys work. And, he, and you just go off this. And it, oh my it, It's God. not a wrestling thing. It's like a normal, just a, being a human thing. Is no, how you but, figure out who but good and bad is. That's, that's not even accurate. <laughs> Based I, on how TNA does their storylines. There was weeks, pretty much like the, if you, to understand the underlying crux of every TNA angle is that nobody likes anybody. Even, oh, yeah. ta- even tag partners hate everybody. And eventually, it's almost, it's, wrestling is written by guys that have always had problems with women, right? Like they're usually geeky guys that somehow got successful and could start having problems and could start getting laid, but instead took their neurosis to the wrestling world, which is what I feel like about Vince Russo. And so a lot of his women are always evil, women always turn on you. No friend will stay your friend, no one will have your back. And large alliances of people and invasions will always crumble and then start another one. So TNA is like a constant backstabbing world. I think that's TNA's mission statement. I think yeah. you just nailed it. But like nobody, there's never, there. I can't think of anybody noble in the history of TNA. Um, Jamie Noble. Oh, Jamie Noble, yes. <laughs> and Ricky Steamboat. They tried to, TNA no. is the company that tried to turn Ricky Steamboat heel. Yes. When he was the in charge of everything. And uh, because Ron Killings told him, hey, racism's holding me back. Remember when racism held you back? I was waiting until Sorg drank, drank that drink to try to make him spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> you almost got him. Yeah. You almost got him. Too. All over that, that, that beautiful, expensive mic. Um, uh, but uh, and then and Ricky Steamboat was like, yeah, racism has held me back. Oh, man. And then like. And, and, and at that point, I, and then Ricky Steamboat, and this list that I have, anytime anybody leaves, it's like mercifully they left before the angle was finished. Ricky Steamboat left around week eight, right around when Vader showed up in a sweatsuit. I lost my mind. <laughs> he literally came out in sweats. Like how I'm dressed now, he got paid to be on it's national TV. Time. <laughs> it's pajama time. Time. He's like, oh my gosh, that's Vader. And he literally just had like black, like, like just your most normal sweats, like not even a logo or anything on like, him. Even if you just watch the four, the first four episodes of TNA, it's a microcosm of the whole company. Like celebrities, celebrities, after the celebrities, second one. celebrities getting over on established wrestlers. <laughs> yes. Um, ha- having someone wrestle twice in the same night, winning two championships. Breaking up your first ever tag team champions in four weeks, um, a puppet master, uh, a midget masturbating in a garbage can, uh, <laughs> um, someone pretending to perform simulated oral sex in the middle of the ring, and then there was a thing with Francine. Oh, where Francine caused the end of ECW? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and they had a feud about it. Uh huh. What's awesome is like TNA supposes, unlike WWE, like the old WWE model was like no wrestling exists anywhere else, which, okay, that doesn't work. 
the TNA automatically assumed that you were up to date on everything that had ever happened in wrestling. Also, they also assumed that you knew every celebrity, no matter what. They're not even D-level celebrities. They, like they, they, they would not make it on, like, celebrity rehab. Yeah. Like, here's NASCAR driver Hermie Sandler. And I'm like, cool. Well, more than half your audience is in the North. And my favorite thing is Hermie Sandler is so much of a celebrity that you said Sandler every single time, and I haven't corrected you because I'm like, yeah, that sounds right. I I because uh, it's Sadler because he he was on Raw too he was a guest host on Raw. Oh. <laughs> I think it's funnier when I say names wrong because my brother uh, when we used to do our podcast would get things so wrong that at one point we let him to believe because he doesn't really watch wrestling so it was fun to watch wrestling with him. He we let him to believe that Randy Orton and Batista were the same person. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then when they showed up in the ring together, we broke the matrix on him. <laughs> What do you think about Guardians of the Galaxy? <laughs> he, he said to me, he's like, Randy, is that Randy Orton? Like, no, that's Batista. Same thing. Whatever. Fuck it. So, so I went back to watch the movie. You guys are bringing up some good points about the history of TNA. But I want to um, I want to just, just throw out some names here. The, the chat room is the, going the chat nuts. Room. The chat room is just... just uh, some great moments, and 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 just uh, I don't know if we kind of quasi lightning round this or something. Eric yeah. Young, Knockouts Tag Champion. Yes, my uh, least favorite wrestler in the history of wrestling is Eric Aww. Young. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Really? I know, I'm sorry. Yeah. I love Eric Young. That's okay. A lot of people do. It's okay. It, it might it might be a little biased because he's one of our first like big gets here on the show. So I, you know, and everybody that that. Like I've had a lot of people say, well, he's a really good guy. And I'm like, I know, but I think he was just in the middle of a TNA mix that he just got hit with shrapnel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you know oh, what I mean? Yeah, uh, no, like, or, uh, after we do the lightning round, we need to try and figure out who is the worst person to been hosed by TNA. Oh, geez. Like, uh, like, well, like wor- the worst worker, because it, there's a list. <laughs> it, 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 might, it might be in this list. Uh, Super Eric is brought up. Oh, yeah? <laughs> that's probably why. I mean, um, when everybody's peeing on you, I get mad at the guy that can't get a good stream. So I think that's yeah. why I didn't like Eric Young. Yeah. Um, Shark Boy, give me a shell, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I believe I have a picture of Stone Cold Shark Boy in here. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that's, that's what I love, that that book, 90% of the gimmicks are other gimmicks that were readopted by TNA, like Macho yep. Man as... Stone Cold Shark Boy. Yeah, Stone Cold Shark Boy. <laughs> A fake Iron Sheik right next to him. Uh huh. Yeah, Sheik Abdul Bashir. Thank you. Thanks for the memories, Davari. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, I zip tied the Undertaker and disappeared the next week. Apparently, Davari's finisher was the WMD. So that's that's lovely. Jeez. Um, Curry man. Uh huh. Yes. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> he announces he can keep going for days. Curry man was interesting. Well, he's a gimmick that came from Michinoku Pro in Japan. That was yeah. Chris Daniels' first gimmick over there. And then he did it in New Japan for a bit. So it was cool. I mean, I'm happy that Chris Daniels stayed there. I kind of went 180 on him because I wasn't totally a fan at first. And then by the end, especially his tag team stuff uh, was awesome. Like He, he was uh, really one of the few bright points at the end there. Yeah, when it was him, Daniels, and Bobby Roode. Yeah. That was great. There was there was one segment I'll never remember the gif of it. I don't even remember what the segment was about. I think it was about like celebrating Rude as being champion. But they got him a giant ass chair and Rude sat on it and couldn't even reach the floor of his feet. So there's this <laughs> there's a part in the segment where he was just kicking his legs like a little baby. <laughs> Not to break up the lightning round, but another favorite TNA moment is when they used to ice Ric Flair and they would put a Seagram's ice in Ric Flair. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. The fact that that shit got on TV is amazing. Like, and the fact that they did on the, like, they didn't just do it in bad six segment, segments, which would have been enough. Yeah. They did it on the ramp. They did it in the ring. <laughs> also, this is the same era where Jeff Jarrett had to clean the toilets and got beat up by Val Venus. <laughs> it happened on the first Monday show, which is... Again, one of the worst uh, nights speak, of my life. Speaking of that first Monday show, uh, who wasn't that? Who was it that couldn't get out of the cage? Homicide. Was that homicide. Yeah. That's. I finally convinced my brother to watch TNA, and we were all excited because he was. I told him, "It's like, well, they're going to be on Mondays up against Raw, and it's not going to be the Monday Night Wars, but it's as close as we're going to get again." Because we used to always get together for it. And right when that cage happened, he just paused his, it, it, and he was like, "I refuse to watch." 
another minute of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's hobbies, I was just hanging out by his legs. Oh, God. This I remember, I remember when we had... Samoa Joe arrived to the airport. So. Yeah. I, I, I remember when the when TNA was going on head-to-head with Raw, I would actually break it up commercial break by commercial break who had the better segment. Oh, man. Oh, that was, that was, that was those were rough times. To you for that. Those were rough times. Because I think that was the point when Raw was kind of unbearable, too. <laughs> It's, it's been a while. It's it's been going on for a while. Uh, Alex brings out, "Hey, remember Hogan coming in? The first thing he said is no more six-sided rings, brother." Yeah. And also, we need a ramp so I can make it down to the ring, brother. Yep. I also love that. Uh, well, no, it wasn't even a ramp. It was a it was a platform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they like it was a wheelchair ramp. That's what it was. <laughs> but it was it was, it was the old it WCW. Was ramp. It was wheelchair accessible, so he could get into the ring. Yep. They also they did an angle in New Japan where uh, Jarrett hit Hogan with a guitar and bloodied him, uh-huh. and then nothing happened for like two years. Yeah, and during, during a press conference. It. Yeah, TNA showed it week after week, like Hogan was coming in, and then there was like eight weeks before Hogan came in, where every single segment was every wrestler talking about Hulk Hogan coming in. Because I remember my reviews would always start with, "Do you know Hulk Hogan's coming to TNA?" and then it would say it almost every sentence. <laughs> yes, I knew. Uh, I was ready for it. Oh, I don't think anyone was really ready for what Hulk Hogan did. Yeah, you know, that's what TNA is like. Imagine, like, imagine the worst thing that you could think of, like throwing up in your mouth and having to hold it in your mouth for an hour. You're like, that's probably going to suck. No, it's going to suck a lot worse. It, it's suck in ways that you cannot even imagine how bad it's going to suck. Like TNA will take you beyond as bad as you think things are going to get. I, but, but see, the problem, uh, the thing is with TNA, the problem has never been the talent. No. That's it's, the thing. Like, like TNA is if you're if you're swiping right on Tinder, all right, yeah. and you you swipe right on this hot girl, you really match with her, you click with her, you talk with her, everything seems great. Go on a date, date's going great. You know, you get into that moment, you're like, okay, do I make the move? Do I not? Make, you make the move, it goes great, and then you go back to her place, and then as soon as the clothes come off, you notice a like Nazi symbol tramp stamp, and it's just like, what the fuck were you even doing this for? <laughs> See, that's what the problem with TNA is. Like, every I used to see people write, like, I hope they go out of business. Like, I don't want them to go out of business. Like, it's no, nice no, I've never said place. that. Yeah, like, nice I've, said that, I've said that to spare myself sometimes, but no. Yeah, but it's <laughs> nice that there's like a place for people to work. But it's like seeing people misused and put into bad situations and just career damaging angles. So, the one of the things I wanted to bring up to you guys was like literally moments before the first TNA broadcast. They had a dark match, and there was a, a beast wrestler named Cheeks. Uh, <laughs> of course, this is Vince Russo, so his name was spelled C H E E X. X, yeah. And yeah, his val- Do you remember his valet's name? Oh, Sweetums, the brown eyed girl. The, oh, <laughs> and he was so heavy that he broke the ring before the first TNA show started. So as they went live, the ring was broken, and they were fixing the ring. Which yeah, is the most Ron, Ron, Don, Ron and Don Harris had to fix it, right? Uh, Aerolux, yes, they were down there fixing the ring, and in the, one of the literally the most indie moments ever. And then the rest of the show was them bringing out old wrestlers that would not be on the show from the past, talking about how great TNA was going to be instead of putting a match out. Also, yeah. the the Dups debuted during the first show, which led to the Dup Cup. Uh huh. Um, which I have the rules of, and the rules still to this day do not of the Dup Cup do not make sense to me. <laughs> if you hit the rules. <laughs> Yeah, if you put someone through a table, you got two and a half points. Five points, it was on fire. If you put someone's head in a toilet, it was two and a half points. Three and a half points if there was poop in the toilet. Okay. If you goosed a woman during the match, you got two and a half points, but three and a half, it was a guy. If you punched the ticket lady or Jeremy Borash, you got two and a half points. <laughs> if a farm animal was in your match, you got two and a half points. If you brought a uh, stick or a blow-up doll into the match, you got two and a half points. Fans gave you a point. Crying, negative five points. If you put your hand, your opponent's head in the cotton candy machine for a full rotation, you automatically won your match. How did this get on TV? And how did people pay for it every week? This was like, you know, people are like, well, I don't like WWE Network, but it's 10 bucks a month, so I keep it. This was 10 bucks a week. And it was two hours of concentrated this. <laughs> it was like, literally, like you, like, there were a couple times I paid. I'm not going to lie. And and then you know, 
that's when the Richard and Rod the Johnson brothers would be on, who were two giant penises managed by Mortimer Plumtree. Mm-hmm. There was also a second penis gimmick, the Hot Shots, which was Cassidy Riley and Chase Stevens, whose whole gimmick was they had erections for the entire match, and they would sit in the middle of the ring and play with themselves. Also, much like Puppet, the extreme midget who you brought up earlier. Um, a puppet, the- also friend of the show. No, oh, really? no, no. Hey, the only, <laughs> the only not I friend of the show. Hulk Hogan's, I also reviewed Hulk Hogan's mini wrestling on our on our site too, which makes TNA look like uh, all Japan from the eighties. <laughs> I will say another thing I do like. I really like the new church gimmick. Uh, I liked Malice a lot, and I liked uh, Slash was pretty awesome, too. He was uh, uh, Trailer Trash. I can't remember his name was in uh, Ohio Valley. But I really liked that gimmick, and especially I like I always like Sinister Minister stuff. So I really liked how those guys kind of went from being heels to kind of all of a sudden getting over. They had some really good matches with the uh, America's Most Wanted, which was a really hot tag team. Pre, uh, what's his name, going to ECW, which is yeah, story. and America's Most Wanted was only put together because they were literally entering the arena at the same time. Wow, that that, that was like that's that's their storyline. That's how uh, James Storm and Chris Harris were first put together on a tag team because I forget who it was. Like someone was supposed to have a tag team match and they couldn't for whatever reason. Like they were attacked backstage or something like that, and. One of the guys backstage was like, hey, you two, you're in a match. <laughs> and, and they walked. They didn't show who it was. Like, they showed two guys. And I'm like, okay. And then when they walk out, I'm like, holy shit, it's AMW. <laughs> okay. Toby Keith was on the first show, too. Oh, Toby Keith was in way too much of TM. And he was performing, and Jeff Jarrett shoved him, and that stopped his performance, which I'm sure the live crowd liked. I'm sure that was probably the best thing to happen. Also, Pittsburgh local Jim Miller was on episode number four because he was the T- the NWA president at the time, and Jeff Jarrett attacked him, tied him up, and sprayed "fu" on him. Oh, I need to find that. <laughs> no, I, there were pictures of him sitting in the crowd. The thing is, he was a heel in Zero One in Japan, and he actually had a shirt. And I have friends that have been looking for the shirt to no avail. Of it, that he sold his merchandise, which would be amazing to have. The other thing I can say I liked, I really liked the Malice Ken Shamrock match from the first show because um, Steamboat called most of the match in the ring mm-hmm. for the guys. And I really liked, I always thought Ken Shamrock was an interesting wrestler to have on top because he was like a legit guy. And he was a, it was, an, it was a recognizable name, both the WWE and MMA audiences. So I thought that was cool. And for some weird reason, I love Sabu fe- feuding with Ken Shamrock. It's like the kind of shit that I would do in video games. I don't even remember Sabu like being in TNA that early on. Yeah, he was by show five. Then also, Scott. Hall, I don't remember Scott Hall being there, and I also don't remember Scott Hall feuding with uh, uh, Brian Christopher. Right? Brian Christopher, yeah, yeah. And the crowd would chant Jerry's kid at uh, Brian Christopher during his match. Uh, well, well, they, well, they did that back in the back in the nineties in WWE too. Uh, yeah. I want to touch on some of the chat room. One was a question. Uh, Robert saying, "What was the name of the group that had uh, Conan, Ar- Road Dog, and Our Truth?" Oh, those the wait, Conan, Road Dog, and Our Truth. Yeah. Um. It was basically it was basically a no, version of what they did in WWE with Road Dog and K Quick. Yeah, that wasn't the Voodoo Kin Mafia. No, that no, was, no, no, uh, no. I was gonna bring up, but like three, yeah, was, was it three live crew? Yes, and they feud nice with Bob, pull, Sorg. Wow, and they feud nice with Bob pull. Armstrong, which I do remember that they would beat up Bob Armstrong. Oh, every oh yeah. they had Bullet Bob Armstrong in an arm wrestling match inside a steel cage. <laughs> that was the blow off. Um, that was the blow off to that feud. <laughs> also, like it was an arm wrestling match inside lo- at lockdown. Th- like, this was brought up. This is brought up. They said they. I guess this came from CZW, the electrified cage. Mm. I don't. There was an electrified cage match in TNA. Oh yeah, the Dudleys were part of that. Oh, that, yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh jeez. Oh, it's like it's like bad medicine. Oh, I also man. forgot Kurt Hennig was there because he was uh, BG James and Six Pac's mystery partner against Jeff Jarrett, Brian Waller, and R Truth when Scott uh, Hall no showed. Yeah, and, and all right, I think the saddest moment in TNA is the saddest moment maybe in wrestling 
TNA is the last time the Macho Man appeared at a wrestling show. Oh, he sure did. It's very sad. <laughs> they built him up for that match, and he's like, "I don't like the way my body looks," so now I'm not not going to do it. Yeah, because he just came out and was like, like a manager or something, right? Like he pointed at somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing yeah. I remember is uh, that I've tried to forget is SEX. <laughs> Sports <laughs> Entertainment Extreme, baby. My favorite. The build up to it starts with Russo showing up as Mr. Wrestling Three, which is the all time greatest sample when Mike Tanay screams, Oh shit, it's Vince Russo, which is the greatest ending <laughs> to a show. And Vince Russo's hair is all over the place. Um, and then he, Vince Russo did that whole promo talking about TNA really meant tits and ass, and uh, which led to Roddy Piper doing a promo on him. And remember in the, in the ring screaming about his cousin Owen Hart and how he killed Owen. And then, uh, Ow. yeah. And then my all time favorite TNA moment, which is when heel Tony Schiavone came for one week. I've quoted it a million times. When he told Mike today, my all time favorite Tony Schiavone line, he goes, You're bullshit. You've always been bullshit. Which is, heel Tony Schiavone is who he is on his podcast now. He's my all time favorite wrestling character. <laughs> and he, like, that lollipop girl was in the ring who was one of the girls, I forget, you know. We're real woke now about how women get treated in wrestling, but in TNA they used to be in cages, and they just oh yeah they just oh, dance more um, the matches. Um, I all right. So this is this is something we tried to do before TNA put up a paywall on their YouTube. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We were doing as kind of a supplement between I believe between seasons of Lucha Underground. Um, we found the old Asylum shows. They put some of them up oh. on their on their YouTube page, and we had never seen them before. So we were like, okay, let's. it was me and Eamon, I believe. Me and Eamon were like, let's watch some of the old Asylum shows and do a little podcast about it. I counted how many cutaways there were to girls in cages. <laughs> I cut for one episode, it was something like 38 cutaways to girls and to dancing girls in cages. Do you remember SEX had a member named Disgraceland who was a fake Elvis? And he feuded with Jorge was Estrada. He, was, he, was he one of the flying Elvises? No, who beat, ironically, beat AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels in the first ever TNA match. That should really tell you all you need to know about TNA. Uh-huh. It really, really does. Like, here we have two of the most young, promising talents in the world, and they're going to get beat by a bunch of Elvises. There's a ton of guys. Like, I have a list of people that spent one night in TNA. Paul Bearer just showed up at the end of the, one of the shows and screamed stuff and never was seen again. Wait, um, what? Did, yeah. he come out as per, did he come out as Percy Pringle? No, he had black hair. I think that they called him Percy Pringle, and they're like, who? Okay. But it was always like the Nitro kind of ending where it was like, he's not supposed to be here. And then this person would do something and then never show up again. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Wrestling 4 showed up, and it was Ivan, Nikita Koloff, who uh, turned, turned against Vince Russo and then left the next week. Bart Gunn, Bart Gunn was in for a week. Moondog uh-huh. Spot teamed with Jim Duggan and beat uh, Glenn Gabretti and Mike Sanders that, of sex and never it showed up again. It definitely sounds like you're reading off a card from the mid-'80s. It's a, um, Becerra was uh, Ron Killing's bodyguard. Mike Awesome was there for a bit. Yep. Lex Luger came in and feuded with AJ while he was up for charges for uh, allegedly killing Miss Elizabeth. Oh, my God. He was up for 13 felony drug charges. And they hyped his match as the most important thing on the show. He, during Before the match, he cut a promo in which he referred to AJ as AC Styles. And then he pretty much beat him up and put him in the torture act until Sting made the save. <laughs> I also forgot that Goldilocks was in TNA. And she mm-hmm. used to talk shit on people while they did promos. Oh, jeez. I was literally, this list of stuff, like, it, it is. Oh, then Larry Zbysko had a mat, feud with AJ. AJ beat him, and Larry Zbysko was forced to be his manager. Then he left. <laughs> also, then I forgot about Ric Flair managing AJ and turning him into the new nature boy. Oh, uh, that was a, that turned out to be really fun, though. It, yeah, I was like, like AJ. AJ couldn't do it justice, but it was a really cool idea. And then my all-time favorite AJ moment is when he was feuding with Sex, and he broke into uh, their locker room with a chainsaw. Do you remember? <laughs> no. Yeah, and he sawed his way into the locker room, and when Disco tried to stop him, he called him a faggot live on the air. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I know. This is not the first time I've, that AJ has said that in TNA. To no, no, it's I'm not. Like, like, 
And it doesn't sound uh, like that word. There's like a fay before it. The gay community. Yeah, the gay. What? Well, I don't know. There's also a wrestler named Cobain whose whole gimmick was he liked to hurt himself. He was in the new church. Oh, with, <laughs> with Brian Lee, one of my all-time favorite wrestlers. Don't ask me why. I don't know why I love him so much. <laughs> um, there was Mad Mikey, who was uh, Crash Wait, Holland. wait, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's yeah, I know. That. I said Crash that. Holly was once called Mad Mikey. Yeah, his whole gimmick was he was mad at things. Um, that that's literally my gimmick on this. <laughs> they, that maybe that's Holy why you got shit. DM'd. Is that why you got DM'd by Dixie Carter? No, oh, but it should have been. Jeez, wow. Okay, so in a, in another universe, I was Crash Holly's once appearance in TNA. Okay then. Yes. Then there was also uh, the first appearance of Jeff Hardy. In TNA, where they would spend whole shows going on about him painting things, where he would just be backstage painting the same painting every week. Uh huh. And then he had a whole group of women that would come to the shows that he called his Hardy Party. Um, they were overweight, hair dyed women who would hang out with him during the show, and they took up an entire front row. This is when TNA had their asylum fans that would fight like anyone else that tried to get into their arena. This is, again, how horrible this is. They all used to post about especially when TNA would do anything wrong, and they would talk about how they controlled the show and stuff, which is hilarious when fans talk about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you remember when uh, there, was, there was one point at TNA where um, Jeff Hardy was so bad at promos because he was so drugged up that they wouldn't have him cut promos. They would have him as an internal monologue, but we could hear it. Oh, yes, I totally forgot about that. Like It was like, James Storm's great. But he drinks too much. Kurt Angle's preoccupied. <laughs> like, uh, he, Ken uh, Anderson, once an TV asshole, TV. always an asshole. It was just like him, like, it was like a, so- a soap opera where he was a character on his own. Yeah. Basically. He also had his own theme song then, too, which I used to remember the words to, but I can't. I, modest. Well, modest. <laughs> modest. I, just started, I was like, that's one of those songs you'll be cutting the grass and you'll be like, modest. To the top, modest, not gonna stop. Mike, what the fuck did that? Jeff happen? Hardy, I'm pretty sure wrote every theme song he had in TNA. I also, this is my lightning round for you guys. If you would like to do it, yes. You ready for my lightning round? Go for it. TNA celebrity involvement. Oh, oh, Chris, can we start with Chris Rock? Can we start with oh, Chris yeah, Rock? Go with Chris Rock, yes. Because <laughs> I remember watching the movie Head of State. Yes. <laughs> Head of state. This is when no one knew anything about this. And I'm like, I because I like Chris Rock. And I'm like, let's see, let's see this movie about Chris Rock becoming president. And it's like, wait, why is he talking to the road dog? <laughs> what is going on? And it just ended up like the Harris brothers beating Chris Rock's ass in the center of the ring <laughs> for like a two second spot. Yeah, and he like, uh, did a whole uh, thing. He's like, TNA is the best wrestling company in the world. Like, Chris. No. no. Uh, the first episode of Impact featured ended with Abyss squashing Shark Boy. After the match, Popeye the Sailor Man from Universal Studios came out and rescued Shark Boy to the back. <laughs> and years later, <laughs> olive years, oil. Yes, I'm so olive glad oil. <laughs> years later, olive oil, also from Universal Studios, would claim to have AJ's baby. And bring a baby doll, which is my all-time favorite TNA. God, movie. God bless you, Claire Lynch. Claire God Lynch. Bless. We yeah. talked about you horribly during that angle, but God bless you. Uh, Johnny Fairplay. Remember, he was the most hated man in America after being on Survivor. Uh, Brian Urlacher, who was not under contract with the Bears. Dennis. <laughs> I was going to say he was not there when he was with the Bears. Definitely. No, not. he was like in between seasons. Yeah, Dennis okay. Rodman was supposed to uh, team with Three Life Crew against uh, Team Canada, and then uh, I- ICP, who had a feud with uh, Disco Kid Cash and David Young. God, I, I when I first saw David Young, because this was after I had watched like TNA, I thought he and Eric Young were related. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> Just just two guys with the same last name have nothing to do with each other. Right. Why would you change that? No, probably not. <laughs> not like a normal wrestling company would do that or anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Death Steve Williams and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. What? 
Like, you don't want to confuse people, but TNA has never had an issue with that. Oh, TNA's, the, I mean, they gave, literally right here, they gave Johnny Fairplay eight appearances, 40 minutes, um, $150,000 contract. And then he got a second contract, and they never used him, so he made $300,000 from TNA. Jeez. <laughs> I also forgot about the time that TNA sent all the balloons to the WWE set because they were also taping at the same place in Orlando, and they got all the pictures on social media of them trying to oh. get over. Oh, yeah. Wasn't that when, like, some of them visited the craft services in Universal? Yes. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> also, there was the Piper's Pit where Kid Cash and Michael Shane attacked Jimmy Snooker before mm-hmm. Sanjay Dutt made the save. That really feels like a Trivial Pursuit question that uh, – you wanna... you, no, you know what that you know what that is. That's hmm. Mad Lib. Oh, it That's is. Mad Lib. Like, <laughs> TNA is. Like, who's like, here like, all right, Piper Spit like segment. That. Yo, uh, you have insert ECW jobber and, <laughs> and TNA jobber attacks WWF legend made save by insert minority wrestler here, <laughs> and that's exactly what you would get. <laughs> I mean. I, oh God, it's so hard to... And we, we can't talk about celebrity involvement without mentioning former TNA Tag Team Champion Pac-Man Jones. Oh, my God. <laughs> he did one spot and won the belt. He didn't, he didn't even do a spot, did he? He, he did, like, like a, did a shoulder he, tackle. I think he did a shoulder tackle or a leapfrog. He, no, he, no, it was a leapfrog because yeah. he was not allowed to touch anyone. Yeah, so he did like a drop down and a leapfrog and then somehow won the belts. He teamed with um, R Truth, right? With sure uh, Killings, yeah, yeah. Well, that guy's had a really long, way longer career than you ever, because he was on the old Shotgun Saturday Nights team with Road Dog. And yeah, then, it's uh, K Crush. Uh, no, yeah. K Quick. K Quick. K Quick. Which they would mistakenly call him throughout the first ten weeks of TNA. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole history of TNA calling people by their WWE names. <laughs> like, you that's... feel like you opened a Pandora's box in my head. Yes. Oh man, my arcane can, knowledge of TNA. Can we talk about poor, poor Abyss? Oh, he's so good. Yeah, he's so good, and he's been with that company for so damn long that I, I can't even name the multitude of things that has happened to Abyss. It's like. I really like, like the angle where he was Joseph Park or oh Joe Park, God. and they were trying to find him. Like it was funny, but it went on too long. Mm-hmm. Joseph Park was one of my favorite things about TNA. Yeah, <laughs> like that was uh, someone had had um, told me because they had read the spoilers, and they were like, "If this is the week I think it is, you're going to be really happy." And Joseph Park returned. Oh yeah, I, I freaked out. I'm like, I almost. I think I actually did make TNA number one on the midweek war that week. That, because I, because I said, I'm like, Joseph Park came back. TNA is getting number one. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Lucha was great. NXT was great. TNA is getting number one. They brought back Joseph Park. <laughs> I remember there was that big rumor that he was going to jump to WWE and do something with Kane. Like I heard he was get, I heard he was supposed to wrestle Taker. Yeah. And like, which would have been great. Like, I'll put him over. Like I wrestled him when he was in a faction with us in IWC, like probably it's like 2008, 2009. And we had a lot of tags and stuff with him. He was aw- an awesome guy to work with. Cause we learned a lot from him. I only wrestled him once. The first time I ever wrestled with him, the first time I ever met him, we were in Canton. I think, I don't know if I talked about this before. With you I guys. think you did on the show. Yeah. And it was like thumbtacks, barbed wire coffin. I'll tell you what though. Like that's what I love about a business gimmick. Cause when you meet him in back, he looks like Joe Park. Or oh, yeah. Well, is, like, he's the nicest guy ever. And then when he's out there with that shit on, I'm like, is this a good idea for him to be out covered in barbed wire and wrestling this maniac who's <laughs> wielding a chain and like running toward me? Yeah, I, I met him once at a signing. He was the nicest guy. Oh, he's super and a great, like a really great mind for putting matches together. And like, he's like one of those guys that I think this is in America, the hardcore style is kind of maligned where it's like, well, that's really not wrestling. But I always looked at his matches. Yeah, he's done some crazy dumb stuff with some tags he doesn't have to do. But, like, if you watch his matches and took that stuff out, the near falls and the way the stories are put together are really great, entertaining matches. And I think he just never got the recognition. I always thought, like, well, maybe they should give him the belt 
or give him a little run on his own to kind of, because he's been a lifer. Other than yeah. Borash, I think he's the longest, probably the longest guy there. Yeah, and, actually, probably is. Yeah. Or maybe yeah, James Storm. Maybe James, James Storm. Storm. Well, that's yeah. why I was so excited when James Storm showed up in NXT. Because oh. I was like, like this is awesome. Because like, I love James Storm, too. And uh, except for his era of hitting people with a beer bottle in his matches, like when he was a heel. Yeah. But um, I was so excited about it. And then it was just like. Yeah, James Storm, when I saw him come back to TNA. Yeah. It was just like, it, it's like, it's like when you're in a bad relationship and you know you're in a bad relationship. But you, leave, yeah. but you decide like, no, you know what? I'm going to move on. I found someone better. And yeah. then. And then once you go on a first date with that person, the ex calls you back and says, I'm pregnant. Yeah. Exactly. And, great and that's exactly what it looks like when he came back. He's just like, oh. I'm just going through the motions now. But WWE yeah. made a big deal about it. They had him on the website. They had problems yeah. with him. They talked about how he was a former And they champ. gave him a win. Yeah. Like, they gave him a they, There are not many guys. Because, like, I think even Eric Young's first match, I don't think yeah. he won. No, he didn't. So it was upsetting. It, I think that's the thing is like I was looking back through my old reviews, especially Aces and Eights era, and like Storm was one of the few guys where I was like, "Oh, this is good." Aces and Eights was like the worst black and white NWO when like Virgil was the leader or thought he was the leader of the of Vincent. Sorry, of, of it. And you're like, "This is the worst stuff." Like we're watching angles about the Harris twins uh, feuding with Horseshoe. Sorry, Horace Hogan, and it's like that's what. Aces and Eights was every week. It's like if, uh, and there was no warrior to say it, no one warrior nation to battle the black yeah, and white end of yeah, um, Who was like the the antagonist for Aces and Eights? I know there was like an ECW original faction. There point. was. Man, I can't. Was that around the same time? No, I don't uh, remember. Oh, hey, hey, Mike, you're getting a little bit of a uh, glitchiness. You, you got a USB headset, right? Yeah. Uh, you might have to un- unplug and plug it back in then, real quick. Okay. Okay. I can't remember. I think it was like everybody against aces and eights for a while. And it was like that whole thing where everybody was turning and then they would find, go in their locker and there was like the cards were just sitting in their locker. Mm -hmm. Like aces and eights are here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I remember there was the shits. (laughs) There were, there was one point where we would get so bored of TNA that we would randomly go to the TNA website and play prices right with their collectible merch. Oh man! Um, actually, you know what? I I may just do that right now while while we're talking about this. TNA yeah. is like the most like it's like wrestling inherently is scummy. I mean, let's let's get that right. But like, like I never feel bad about WWE Shop Zone. It, like it doesn't make me feel bad about the fact that there's merch. And I, I don't know how we got this far without bringing up Don West. Oh, Don West. The Don West. Remember when he was Amazing Red's biggest fan and he would jump to the top of the announcing table and chant, go Red, go, and try to get the crowd to chant? <laughs> and it's by comparison, I bought Enzo hair from WWE Shop, and I don't feel bad about it, right? And you, It was like autographed piece of a Jeff Jarrett guitar, $49. <laughs> um, okay, all right. So here's a fun game that we play. All right. Um, on TNA's collectible site, okay, yeah, there is a there is a turnbuckle pad. Now they say turnbuckle, but I'm like the the metal part is not included in this, so it's a turnbuckle pad. So first of all, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> event use from Slammiversary from this year, okay, uh, with autographs on it from D'Angelo Williams, Alberto Patron, LAX, EC3, Laurel Van Ness. Kong, for some reason, Rosemary, Cowboy, uh, James Storm, Abyss, Jeff and Karen Jarek, and more. There are only six turnbuckles offered for sale, and I'm pretty sure they haven't sold any of them. Is it six-sided ring? <laughs> but um, how much do you want to guess that it's selling for? I'll, get, I'll give you a hint. There, there is a discount off the manufacturer retail price. Which for for it for collectors of it does not exist. The manufacturer retail price is eight hundred dollars. Wow! So it's less than that. Two hundred. Okay. 
175. $700. Jeez. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, whoever buys that should just get the company. Well, I don't think anyone's I don't think anyone has ever bought them. There are only six available, which why are there six available? I don't know, because there should theoretically be twelve. <laughs> but um they also have pieces of a ta- of a broken table signed by Moose and Eli Drake. <laughs> they have one signed by Rosemary and Sienna. Um oh, man. Yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of messed up stuff. My favorite TNA ism is what I say all the back is every time Mike today something would be happening, Mike today would be like, "Let's go to the back, <laughs> to the back." <laughs> or oh, oh, all right. So this was one thing TNA did that really pissed me off all the time. <laughs> Someone's asking in the chat room, "Is the tape library included?" For seven hundred dollars, you can go to any half price books. Trust me. Oh, Alex Charles was saying EV two was the ECW reunion TNA. Oh my god, I forgot because Balls was in it. Yep. And, Ball, uh, oh god. Yeah. Was and they Sandman in it? Too? But yeah, and, and Rhino was in it, but they called him. Um, oh, they called him something different. <sighs> yeah, I can't remember. God. I don't even remember because because WWE had like all the names at that point. This is like remembering the car crash that killed your family. <laughs> like you need to tell the lawyer what happened, but like you don't want to remember. It's it. too traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, there was. Oh, there was one time where whoever was scripting the show literally did not know how to script it with commercials. Oh, yeah. So every time they ended, they would finish the show on YouTube. I Keep fr- in mind, I remember this, is, this was when this was taped. It wasn't live. And they did uh, every show would end with, stay tuned for reaction. <laughs> <laughs> like TNA reaction. They would finish the main oh. event on YouTube and then have a post show. I, oh God! I have a list here of the twenty worst moments of TNA. I disagree with a lot of these, <laughs> but I, I'm sure we can think of some more, some worse moments. Oh, uh, well, Joker Sting is a, is number twenty. That's a lie. Joker Sting was his best version. You think? I, I I truly believe that because it looked like he was actually having fun. You know the story about his nickname, right? About real estate, no. Steve. One of the MMA guys that was there um, worked out at Sting's gym and didn't know that Sting was a wrestler. So whenever Sting came backstage and was meeting everybody when he started, they, he's like, "Hey, that's real estate, Steve." And they're like, "What are you talking about?" He goes, "Oh, he's a guy who comes to our gym, tells everybody real estate tips. He's a great guy." I'm like, "Well, that's Sting. He's like one of the greatest wrestlers ever." He goes, "Nah, that's real estate, Steve." So for years, that's what I've called St- Sting. <laughs> real estate, Steve. <laughs> Road Warrior Joe's animal's name, too, in my life, <laughs> which is a much better name. Oh, God. Real Estate Steve is great. <laughs> That's how he should have showed up in WWE. Oh, my God. Well, it's, isn't it kind of how he showed up? Like, he was well, yeah. He was treated he, he so was well. Ju- he was literally just taking up real estate. <laughs> yeah. I like whatever you're like, oh, the NWO is back together and DX. And I nah, forget this. And and why why is why are Hall and Nash helping Sting? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, so what what else is on this twenty worst? Uh, I forgot when um, uh, Relic. Oh, hey, did you know that's killer spelled backwards? Uh, yes, <laughs> as they told me every week. And also, it, there was, I got um, to a point where every time there was a new uh, shitty. Gimmick and TNA. I would always just say, "Oh, it's Jobber spelled backwards." A puppet pulling a gun on Tom Arnold and uh, Jeff Jarrett. I mean, to be fair, he probably should have just finished the job at that point. We wouldn't even be here talking right now. Oh, <laughs> Ooh. what on Tom Arnold? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you already, right. you already did True Lies. It was great. I mean, where else after that? Uh, what was uh, Goldust's gimmick when he was with Rob? Black Rain? That's right. Oh, the Black rat. Rain. Black Rain with his rat, rat named Terry. That's right. Poor, poor Marlena. 
Poor uh, Orlando man. Jordan's bisexual game. Yep. Oh, oh God. The the lotion. It puts the lotion on its skin or else it gets the job again. You ever really poured the, the milk all over his face and he wrestled the match with milk all over him? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so do you feel I, – I have this thought. Do you feel like Velvet – or uh, what, what the hell was his name? Velveteen Dream. Velveteen? Velvet Dream? Uh-huh. Yeah. Velveteen Dream. Velveteen yeah. Dream is like a a – like make good on bisexual Orlando Jordan of some yeah, sort. Yeah, it's the same gimmick. It is, but it's just well, like, mean, it, but this is okay. Prince. Yeah, it's Prince. Oh yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I it, that, it definitely seems like a tamer version of it. Mm-hmm. Orlando Jordan acted like that, I guess, backstage and at the bar after shows too. And it got to the point that Ric Flair of all people, he who gets naked and wags his dick around wearing the belt after shows. Uh, got so upset the way he acted, he told him to settle down and to get out. That and that's probably just Ric Flair's personal stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, hey, stop stealing my gimmick. Fitting people with their dick is my job. I forgot Woo! when there was the Indian invasion uh, in TNA with uh, Mahabila Sarah. Oh, Mahabali TNA? Shira. Yeah. The Mahabali Shira is the worst wrestler I've ever seen in TNA. I have never seen a good I have never seen a passable match with Mahabali Shira they in it. Tried to get that Twitter thing going for his dance. Oh yeah, yeah, and he didn't know how to do it half the time. It was Um there was a time when TNA was first going to do their India tour during the Bound for Glory tournament. That it was a rumor that Mahabali Shira was going to win that title in India. Oh, oh, that's right. And again, WWE was like, hey, that old TNA gimmick was really good. We should do that one, too. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Terry is another worst moment of TNA. Oh, Rob Terry wasn't horrible. He, and not- Eric, w- Eric Watts is another one. I forgot Eric Watts was there. <laughs> I don't think Rob Terry or Eric Watts deserve to be on the tw- the top tw- the bottom twenty list of. TNA. Well, Eric Watts was Goldilocks' boyfriend. That's how he came in, oh, and geez. then of course he turned. Our- Lacey Von Eric is number ten on the list, which makes me so happy. <laughs> oh, oh, Lacey! Did, did I- you ever see the video on YouTube of Lacey Von Eric POV wrestling? No. Oh, that that that's worth a look. <laughs> it's 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 unnerving. <laughs> uh, also, Ric Flair did the thumbtack match with Mick Foley, which is really the nadir of his career. I think yeah, recently on featured on the Thirty for Thirty. That's right. ESPN, yeah, which I, I can't I can't believe they did that. Which, oh, I can't they couldn't they get the about. WWE footage. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Like, I think the only footage they have was uh, from WrestleMania. Yeah, the uh, I'm sorry, I love you. Yeah, that's yeah. um, that, that you know, and and that's something that both Ric Flair and and Mick Foley has even I think addressed it in in the latest um, documentary they did with him was like, yeah, I went and did a match after my retirement. It was a bad idea. Yep. Oh yeah. So, yeah. I've heard Jim Neidhart coming in to feud with uh, Jay Lethal for one night. Jeez. Jesus Christ. Uh, Mr. Spectacular, Jesse Go- Goddard. Oh, no. Jesse Goddard's turned really good. He did. Jesse Goddard's turned amazing. The, uh, oh, the bromance? Yeah. The bromance were awesome. The first night he came in, though, where they made it like a big deal, like everybody should know who he is. Oh, yeah. No, they, they tried to make it a big deal. And I'm like, why not just bring this guy in and have him work his way up? And that's what eventually what happened. Yeah, he got really good. I yeah, Jesse Goddard's is great. I really like Jesse Goddard's. I forgot. I ha- Again, TNA is like one of those places where, like, how did I forget Garrett Bischoff? <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if if there's one person not mentioned on there, I, I need to bring it up. Uh, Remember did, Garrett did you- Bischoff had his name over his heart? Like it was like <laughs> he was always wearing a Carhartt shirt. Yeah, and it was always it was in the Ford. Um, it was yes. in the Ford logo. And then he he had that match with his dad where he threw his dad in the toilet and he came out with all the blue sh- blue shit in his hair. And that was what was supposed to write off uh, uh, Eric Bischoff. Uh, big, fat, oily guy who was... Uh, hey, hey, hold on. That is longtime friend of the show, Krista Joseph. It is. 
<laughs> as a longtime friend of the show, Krista Joseph, now co executive producer on Lucha Underground. <laughs> uh, we all have our bad part. Oh my God, how did I forget this? Jenna Maraska, who did the uh, <laughs> that match with Charmel, which is pretty much considered the all time worst match ever. It's where really the bad. it's, it's where really the bad. Botchamania minus five stars shout comes from. <laughs> and Pittsburgh's own Jenna Maraska. How can I forget? Uh. She went to Duquesne. <laughs> Man, isn't it sad where they're like, who was the most successful wrestler other than Kurt Angle and Bruno San Martino to come from Pittsburgh? And you're like, Jenna Maraska? <laughs> I would DJ well, I mean, Z, okay. Well, but... I mean, you can say you can say Elias Sampson now. Yeah, and DJ Z. Yeah, that's you true. Say, you can say uh, ball speaking of criminally underused in TNA, yeah, DJ Z, burr, 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 burr. Oh. Oh, just they they never pulled the trigger on him like properly. I trained him, so I, he's I I always like don't want to put a I I'm putting him over because I just because of his own talent, he's awesome, and it's like he's one of those guys. And Meltzer's even talked about it. Like I wish that he would start for NXT, but. He would he would be amazing on two hundred five live. Yeah, he'd he be amazing on two hundred five. He can do, he can do character stuff, but then also work and then like, do amazing stuff in matches too. Like I thing. would I would I would love to see a feud, um, DJZ versus TJP. Yeah, it would be awesome. That'd be great. That'd be, be just like it'd be like dance fighting at some point too, which would speaking be speaking awesome. of TJP. <laughs> I forgot about suicide. The character yeah, based on a video. we all did. We yeah. all forgot about suicide. <laughs> And uh, also that he took his mask off and Hogan said, come on, take that mask off, brother. You don't have to be that anymore. Then he's like, you're TJ Perkins. And everybody who does that, people are like, who? Yeah, and people were like, wasn't he Chris Daniels first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and will he be somebody else again? Uh-huh. Because <laughs> Suicide, if you remember, the only character ever to first start in a video game. Yep. But here's the thing. Dixie Carter always talks about how she's a PR person. What PR person would name your new top baby face suicide? Uh-huh. A name that they couldn't even use for the action figure. They had to like censor it out when the action, the, if anyone remembers the worst figures ever, the Jack's TNA figures that came out were bad, but then they did dollar store versions that had different size heads. The uh-huh. Samoa Joe head is this much bigger on his body. It's one of my favorite. It's one of the few wrestling figures I haven't sold. And I, I just have it sitting on my desk just to remind me. Also, when Samoa Joe got kidnapped. Uh, <laughs> by, the ninjas, nice, by the ninjas. By the ninjas in a van. And they came in the van, the nation of violence kidnapped him. Also, well, no, no, we, never, we never found out who that was. No. We never found out who that was. That's like, that's like who was driving the limo in WCW. Like, we never found out who that was. I really think we need to do maybe at some point one more of these because like the all the Scott Steiner stuff in TNA never got. Oh, oh geez. Scott Steiner. All right. The greatest Scott Steiner moment in all time in TNA is uh-huh. when he was fighting Jeff Jarrett in a hardcore match. And Scott Steiner was on a pogo stick. Oh, that's right. I, uh, I, I, I did just recently share the, the math promo. Oh, on the so show Facebook. It's, so it's still amazing. Um, still amazing. so we, we do need to wrap up here. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think if, you know, We've talked about a lot of the ups and downs, mostly downs of Impact Wrestling, TNA, <laughs> um, and, and we didn't even get into the most recent stuff of of you know who knows what's happening with the, you know uh, the branding and the their ownership and oh, everything. The, the, but they're on they're on TV every week nowadays saying mm-hmm. MMA is better than pro wrestling. Oh boy! But anyways, just like Dave Meltzer. What yeah. what is the biggest takeaway you you have? What did what did you what is the what have you learned? from TNA wrestling. <laughs> what is the one big thing you've learned from TNA wrestling over the years? Leaving it is the best thing you can do. Ooh. Yeah. No, no, I'm serious. Just just look at the track record. Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Kurt Angle, um, Okada, uh, Eric Young, Bobby Roode. <sighs> I'm, I'm, and there's more. Jeff Hardy. Even Jeff Hardy came back. Matt Hardy came back. Uh, leaving it is the best thing you can do unless your name is Hulk Hogan. I think because the only the only person who I think did worse after he left TNA was Hulk Hogan. I think the one guy who did well there, Bully Ray, is the only guy, one of the few guys I can think of that became better. 
Mm-hmm. Like the Bully Ray yeah. character, I loved. As mm-hmm. much as I hate Aces and Eights, him as a heel and work great and cutting the weight and everything, he was awesome. Yeah, Bully Ray. Bully Ray was one of the legitimate high spots of TNA. And that was I was kind of sad that he didn't get to do that character in either NXT or WWE because I think that that character could have really uh, had like another year of steam on a, on a bigger stage. Definitely, absolutely. Because they tried the the Bubba Ray uh, solo gimmick when they um, did the first draft. Yeah, and he was the hardcore champion and everything, and he was really good. He was out of yeah. shape, but he was really good. And he just took all that stuff and used it in his Bully Ray character. And Bully Ray was amazing. And then you also got Batista to come in with Devon. That's God, what horrible knowledge I have yeah. of wrestling. T- Tina's saying Mr. Anderson was an upgrade, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I take it back. Eric Young is not my least favorite wrestler of all time. <laughs> Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson is my all-time least favorite wrestler of all time. Like. I've never seen either him or Mike Sanders. I've never seen two guys that like were seemed more above wrestling and didn't care that just were the sh- just the dregs of making me hate everything about life. Hashtag below average Mike Sanders. <laughs> I, I think what I took away is that if you think so, there's 15 years of TNA. And it was two hours a week, 52 weeks a year. Oh no, no, don't do this math. Yeah. Don't do this math for me. So each. So what is that? Fifty-two weeks times two hours, sometimes three hours, but what? One hundred and four hours a week. That's the job. Bad at math from taking chair shots. Four days a year, so sixty days of my life, not counting pay-per-views, okay. European specials, Direct TV only specials, British boot camp. Uh, what was the show that was on uh, YouTube after the show? Reaction. Reaction. I probably spent over two months, and that's two months of staying up, like on meth. Or Adderall, 24 hours straight. And that doesn't even count the podcasts and reviews that we've done the time I oh into God, that. Dude, I would spend <laughs> three to four hours looking up references and like and like funny quotes and clips and like and like converting clips and making animations and stuff when I would do my reviews. Dude, I, if I spent that much time on my career, <laughs> I would be so far ahead. I, I'm happy now. I have my own business and I do well. I would be so much further ahead. Like, say if I took one thing that I never did before, like, not TV VCR repair, but, like, let's pick, like, something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, say, like, building model ships, and I'd never tried it before. But if I took 60 full days of nothing else, not even eating and sleeping, 60 full concentrated days on building model ships, I would be the best model ship builder, arguably, in the world. Instead, I wasted my time on TNA, and that really is the saddest. The, the person at TNA treated the shittiest was me. <laughs> both of us both wow of us. both of us yes both of us, like, both of us. when i met you the last time i felt an instant bond when i looked in your eyes i saw the the sadness that only someone that has watched tna for this long it was like you it's like, like it's like when you look at a puppy during the arms of the angels commercial like oh yep, yeah i know that i know that pain I know you that know those, those movies where like uh, like victims of abuse all get together in a support group and they look at each other and instantly <laughs> just walk to each other. Like if I could have hugged you, I just saw this look in your face and I'm like, you live through the Voodoo Kin Mafia too, and you're like, no mm-hmm. more words, and we just embrace, <laughs> just sad bloody tears streaming down our faces. And, and you know what the really funny thing is? I stopped watching TNA at the last um, Slam anniversary. Oh, and my life has infinitely improved since then. <laughs> You know what, like, you would think, like, part of me would be like, I wonder what happened in TNA. Like, I should check that back out. At no moment, like, it was the best cold turkey I've ever, like, because I've had to quit other things, and you're like, I'd really like to do that again. You know what I mean? I'd really mm-hmm. like to start, start drinking more again. No, there's no moment where, where I was like, <laughs> like, oh, just a one more hit. I missed that one hit at TNA. No, like, like, right now, we like, talked about it for an hour, and I have no interest. Like, occasionally, I, um, one of the sites I go to does like um, a fun review of TNA. I'm yeah. like, oh, let me just click on this, and I just start reading the first paragraph. I'm like, wow, I, yep, I'm, I'm really, I'm glad I'm not watching this anymore. I was going to just... start watching it when Billy Corrigan took over. And, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we and... didn't, fuck, we didn't even talk about Billy, motherfucking Corrigan. Well, maybe we'll have a part two of this, oh, guys. Oh, we'll have to have a part two. <laughs> We'll have to have a part two of this. Yeah. Uh, Sork, I have we so do, many things to do. say, and I don't want to take like, – if I start, it'll just – Yeah. No. Sork, we have some lessons in the chat room. We do it? We do? We, we, do. we do. Okay. All right. We Real do. quick well, here. Uh, Alex Carr says he learned that the lower is expectations for wrestling television. 
uh, <laughs> Alex Miller learned that they have amazing wrestlers, but trouble writers and uh, trouble writers and management. Yes, yep, that's accurate. Um, that's accurate. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, jeez. I tell my one last TNA story. But my brother used to be a DJ for wrestling, um, and because he had all the equipment, he was a DJ before he did his career now. So he would always play the music on like IWC shows, Steel City shows. And he had, I don't know why, he had this gimmick where every time someone would give him the title belt, he would write his name behind the plate because he was a graffiti guy, kid too. So almost every belt in TNA got tagged with my brother's name behind the plates. And then, so he decided after one show, we all went out to eat and AJ was with us and he's like, well, where do you want to go eat? And AJ's like, I don't know, Arby's is good. And I was like, you're a fucking world champion. We're not going to fucking Arby's. He's like, Rick Flair doesn't go to Arby's. And he goes, Rick Flair makes a lot more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> so we got him extra potato cakes and horsey sauce. Oh, oh poor AJ. <laughs> we did, I actually did a gif on our, because we told that story in the podcast, and I had a gif of AJ wearing the Arby's hat, and it said good mood food when that was the Arby's uh, tagline. And his <laughs> his old vest that with the hood up had like the Arby's mitt on the, on the back of it. It was like the most... <laughs> The most I've spent on a Photoshop. And I really like AJ. He's an awesome dude. But it was, I was like, I hope he never sees this. Other than me, the, the gif I made of Chris Benoit wearing the Homer Simpson choking Bart shirt, it's probably the thing I'm most embarrassed about that I've done in my career. Jeez. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm glad that you guys have come together on this. Some new yeah. fast friends uh-huh. over Impact Wrestling. Shirley Doe, uh, is there anything you want to plug? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, the Rise Wrestling uh, is. I yes, saw you went to one of the shows. Their shows are great. Um, yep. P, I'm in PWX Wrestling still too, and you can visit my movie site uh, to see me write about satanic horror movies instead of wrestling uh, with this much zeal at bnsaboutmovies.com, and we do a podcast there too. So, and I really, hey guys, I really appreciate you inviting me because it's been a rough week of work so this was an awesome break in the middle of my work week and, and I, it was a very cathartic moment these are things that I can't talk about to my wife because she just rolls her eyes and she's like I don't care about wrestling we, we should just do this like once because Tina's saying she wants to be on the panel I'm like <laughs> Tina we'll do a part two you can, can, I, can I join the misery panel she says oh. <laughs> it really feels like this was more entertaining than any episode of TNA Jesus. Not like, not to put my put ourselves over, but there was oh, more I, forethought and yeah. more planning. Yeah, and and we actually had a finish. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mad Mike ah. is Mad Mike four eight eight three on the Twitter. You can see him all uh, over Wrestling Mayhem Show Network. Absolutely, uh, I don't know how much you will see me on uh, recently because I'll probably be working a lot. Yeah, but um, but back in January we will come back strong and. God willing, when Lucha starts taping again, Sorg, we have plans. Absolutely. I think we have plans. Yeah. And Absolutely. you got the new Arrow Lucha promotion starting with the Harris brothers running it soon and Conan booking, which is going to be like the TNA of Lucha. So you got that oh, to look forward to. Oh, boy. oh, my God. Oh, oh, I, I think I just vomited in my mouth a little bit. Oh, and of course, please check out everything at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. A lot of great stuff going on. And I say we're going to have a series of these over the holidays, so please stay tuned. We're going to keep you in the mayhem over the over the time. Uh, so, you know, when you're open in the presence, you can still listen to the, the, the mayhem. Because I, actually, I think it is on, I think, is, isn't uh, Christmas on a Tuesday this year, maybe? Christmas Monday, is on Tuesday? a Tuesday. No, so, Christmas is on a Monday. It's on a Monday. So, because Raw is way. going live. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, that'll be interesting. Poor, poor people. All right, so thank you so much, Shirley Doe, Mad Mike, for joining us. Uh, We'll see if we can do this again. Until the next time, Mayhem out. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.